energy in electrostatic fields. Remember previously, we found the energy for a volume charge distribution. We built up to it. We did an, an ensemble of point charges and looked at that equation and generalized it to, of ultimately, generalize it to a volume. And we ended up here, which is essentially adding up a one half Q times V, if you remember. So for Maxwell's equations, we have Gauss's law, which says the divergence of the electric flux density is this volume charge density term. So let's replace the volume charge density with del dot D. And so that's where we are here. Now there's a general rule in vector calculus and it's the product rule for divergence. So if we have the divergence of some scalar times a vector, well, we can expand it this way. Writing this product rule in terms of the parameters that we have above, yeah, we would write our product rule this way. Now, this second term is really the same as the argument in our integral up here. We just move the V to the other side down here. So to make it look similar, we can move the V over here and let's solve this product rule for that term. So this is the argument in our volume integral above, and we can replace it now with these two terms. So here's that volume integral from the previous slide that we now know we can replace with two terms that came from the product rule. Well, now we can separate this into two volume integrals. And we end up here. Well, where do we go from here? Remember the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem lets us convert between a closed contour surface integration and a volume integral of divergences. Let's use this. So this is the, the total energy with our two integrals that we had from last slide. But look what we have here. We have a volume integral of some kind of divergences. So we have the right-hand side of the divergence theorem. That means we can write this as a closed contour surface integration. That's what's done here. So let's go ahead and replace this volume integral with this closed contour surface integral. And we end up here. Now, the next thing we need to do is think about this first term a little bit more. So this is the equation from the previous slide. Let's go term by term and think about their dependence on R, distance from the origin. So the electric potential, if you remember, is proportional to 1 over R. The electric flux density is proportional to 1 over R squared. Our differential surface, that's proportional to R squared. Well, we're multiplying all of these together. When we do that, we see that the argument of that closed contour surface integration is proportional to one over R. So as R gets bigger, that argument inside the closed contour surface integration gets smaller and smaller. We're allowed to choose any surface. So what if we let that surface go out to infinity? That's perfectly valid. When that surface goes out to infinity, this R term is infinity. And in fact, the argument inside that surface integration then goes to zero. So we've just with a little bit of hand waving, we've shown that this first argument goes to zero and we can drop that from our expression of total energy. And ultimately what we're working toward is total energy just from the fields themselves. But we don't quite have fields. We have this uh, electric potential here. and We don't want that. We just want electric fields. So this is where we were from the previous slide, and we'd somehow like to get this terms in terms of just the electric field. So what we'll do is take this negative sign and bring it inside and associate it with this gradient of the electric potential. So now, does this look familiar? Well, we had a definition that related the electric field intensity to the electric potential. And in fact, that was it. So we can replace this negative gradient of the electric potential with the electric field intensity. In fact, this is our final equation. So we have the two electric field terms, D and E, 
And so one half, the dot product of D dot E, if we add all that up over the volume, that gives us the total energy stored in the electric fields. And this is a completely general equation. Well, very often, for some reason, people don't like to give the general equations and they want to try to simplify things, even if it's not necessarily simpler. So the standard approximation is, well, what if the materials are linear, homogeneous, and isotropic? Does that equation for total energy in the fields change at all? Well, in an isotropic medium, we have this D equals epsilon E. So we can replace D in our energy equation with epsilon times E. Now we have an E dot E. That's really just the magnitude of E squared. And so that would be our final equation for energy stored in the electric field for an LHI media. And maybe it's a little bit simpler because we don't have a dot product. We just have to calculate the magnitude of E and square it. But just remember that equation, while a little bit simpler, is only valid in linear, homogeneous, and isotropic media. Uh, if it's not linear, not homogeneous, or not isotropic, then we have to integrate D dot E. So far, we've derived two different equations for calculating the total energy stored in the electric field. This first one is valid for all cases, completely general. This second one, a little bit simpler, but not a whole lot. That's only valid for linear homogeneous isotropic materials. But if we stare at these equations, if we integrate something to get a total quantity, then that something we're integrating is a density. And so, in fact, we can look at those arguments and say that is the energy density in the electric fields. So we can summarize all of this. If we want to get total energy, we can do a volume integral of the differential energy. And so the energy density, little w, the general case is one half d dot e. But for linear homogeneous isotropic material, it's one half epsilon times the magnitude squared of e.